afternoon, everyone. This is Alicia McGrath, and um, I am your chatter and technical guru. We'll, we'll laugh quietly on that one <laughs> um, for this afternoon's um, webinar. I'm going to give it um, over to Krista here in just a couple seconds. Just a couple housekeeping things. Of course, um, if you do have any questions as we go along or experience technical difficulties, just put it down there in the uh, chat box, and um, I will try to help out as much as I can. And when we are finished with um, today's webinar, just click the X in the upper right-hand corner, and it will close everything um, down for you. And Stephanie, I'm not quite sure what it does on the app, but I'm sure you know how to exit out when you're ready to go. And I'm going to try the app out sometime. But right now, I'm going to stop blabbing, and I'm going to turn it over to Krista. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone's having a good day. I know I am excited <laughs> to be with you guys today and get a little bit of a break from my uh, normal routine and jump, uh, jump right back into something that I really love and miss uh, from being in a library. So uh, today, we're going to spend the, our time together talking about very, very broadly um, about graphic novels. Um, just a little bit of a preface, because I did see some of the things that were coming into the chat box. Um, some people were wanting to know about methods and some resources for finding uh, things to add to their collection and make it um, better for their library, and that's something I definitely do hope we, we will accomplish uh, by the time we finish today. Um, however, other people were wanting to know more about um, specific titles and different things like that. Um, I will say that this the kind of idea of this was to be broad, and I know I will not touch on you know absolutely everything, but I do plan on coming back at the beginning of 2017 um, and doing a reader's advisory specific training on graphic novels. That is not necessarily going to be the emphasis of today. So like I guess we'll get we'll spot check some things here and there, and I do hope that as we go along, especially when we get towards the end for time for sharing, that. Um, some of you all that do feel a little bit more comfortable, um, I did see a few names I recognize. I know that you guys are reading um, out there and collecting for your library. I hope you guys will share, uh, but we will not be specifically talking about um, a wealth of titles today. This is more a how to, um, you know, best practices for collecting graphic novels in your library. So with that, we will just, if my PowerPoint here wants to progress. <laughs> Bear with me, guys. All right, there we go. <laughs> so this is what we do hope to discuss in today's webinar. We'll just do a very, very brief um, history to kind of get us up to speed about um, the popularity of graphic novels uh, today. Um, then we're going to spend a lot, most of our time, focusing on the educational benefits, um, kind of myth-busting about uh, misconceptions and assumptions people have about uh, the benefits of reading comic books and reading graphic novels. So this, you know, hopefully make your job a little bit easier when you get um, very well-meaning uh, but misinformed parents, maybe even some teachers and colleagues, to how to best uh, talk and uh, get these graphic novels to circulate more widely. And then we'll talk about um, best practices and some things that I have done in previous positions in terms of um, collection development around graphic novels and some of my favorite resources, everything from blogs, websites, to things that you can actually check out here from KDLA. And then we will wrap up with um, some programming and how to really just make a well-rounded approach to putting your collection to use. And now that I have got my obligatory uh, Thor gift out of the way. <laughs> we do love some Thor. Um, I, background, I used to, when I was um, selecting graphic novels for one of my libraries, we also would used to do fun promotions. And I, one year we did um, cardboard cutouts of popular characters. And so I had Thor in the teen area. And then when we uh, rotated him out for some Hunger Games cutouts, he uh, then lived at my desk and would always... Uh, People will come and talk to Thor for wisdom and advice. So I miss him at KDL Life. <laughs> Where is he? <laughs> Where is he? I know. We've got to we've got to work on that. So we'll go ahead and uh, get going. So we're going to start today with just, again very very 
basic of just understanding what the differences are between um, the wealth. Because a lot of people just assume that a graphic novel is a comic book. And um, that's not exactly the whole truth. So what most people are probably familiar with is a comic strip, something you would see in the funny pages and newspapers uh, back in the day. That's just, you know, the short, uh, a very short sequence, a uh, very easy in terms um, uh, like visually to follow, just a few short blocks together, a few uh, small word bubbles. Everything's very easy to kind of understand. From there, you'll go into the comic book, what you uh, mostly think of when you think of a comic shop. And so a comic book is a serialized comic appearing uh, maybe first in a magazine-sized booklet, um, typically made of lower, cheaper, to produce quality paper, um, and then they are bound. They can um, be part of a story, so they can be serialized or can be, you know, one whole story in one whole issue. Then from there, we move into the graphic novel. A graphic novel is a novel-length, self-contained comic or a collection of the serialized comics bound into a single volume. Um, they can be bound in hardback or they can be uh, soft bound, but again, higher quality uh, production that goes into it and it's typically a self-contained universe. Um, and then we'll get later into it. Graphic novels can be fiction or they can be non-fiction. So that whole genre has really, really exploded and we'll get into uh, touch on some finer points of that a little bit later. Furthermore, this is not to be confused with manga, which is a stylized Japanese graphic novel. Um, it reads a little bit differently, and we'll t have a slide um, that discusses that a little bit later. Um, manga is a genre of graphic novels, much like the idea that a mystery is a genre of fiction. And manga, again, comes from Japan. It features a very unique aesthetic, both in terms of its uh, the storylines and the illustrations. And that is the literary version of anime, which is, again, from Japanese origin, but it is um, the television or film format. So, again, lots of different terms to kind of know, and if you're real hardcore fans, they will hit you on that if you don't know the difference. So, an anime can often be a source material uh, but it is not the book. So manga often involves from anime, but that is different from a Western comic book. <clears throat> and just kind of another point um, to a lot of things that you'll see, a, a source I'll kind of talk about later in terms of um, reviewing Things. They'll often say, we only review things a library can collect, such as bound graphic novels and prose books that are directly um, related to graphic novels. Not a lot of libraries are collecting uh, comics yet, though some of them are out there. Um, and that is something I can talk about later as we get on to collection development practices. It's just not as widely seen uh, because they do tend to be harder uh, to keep up with as well as the actual physical uh, item itself tends to be very hard to preserve after several circulations. So with that, <clears throat> a lot of questions that you get from very beginning readers is just how to read panels. So again, you have just this funny little example of a comic strip, uh, very easy, very defined uh, lines and arts. Um, so I found some really great resources I'd like to uh, point you to um, down here in the links. Uh, but why this really matters is that comics and graphic novels are a great way to introduce the concept of visual literacy. And so um, what is visual rhetoric or what is visual literacy? Uh, funny enough, the Writing Center at Duke University has a fantastic handout on their website um, that goes into a lot of great detail about this. Uh, the simplest definition is that uh, visual rhetoric is how or why visual images communicate meaning. Um, visual rhetoric is not just about uh, a superior design or aesthetics, but it's also about how culture and meaning are reflected, communicated, 
and altered by images. Visual literacy involves all the processes of knowing and responding to a visual image, as well as all the thought that might go into constructing or manipulating an image. So it's often looking at pictures and deriving meaning. Um, that's also ties directly back to one of the uh, foundational early literacy skills so that um, children can form their foundation of reading. So, um, yeah, often reading graphic novels and comics introduce an elevated way to do that. So, but, you know, people, as the art form has evolved, people get kind of scared of how to read the panels. You go from something as basic as a comic strip here to something like Superman, where we have multiple text boxes in one uh, piece of art that are kind of in various, uh, you know, locations around the page to something with multiple overlapping uh, boxes here like this uh, Wolverine uh, comic. And so just how exactly are we meant to read them? Typically, um, you know, or Western comics, they, you do follow just like you would on a prose page. You're going to read left to right. Um, are the comics and graphic novels, not always, um, but they're usually in full color. They involve more square panels, more varied art style, um, whereas Eastern or like the manga titles and things, they're going to read opposite, um, right to left. Usually they're in black and white. Um, they have a more fluid layout, and that's where you can maybe see some more complex visual patterns. Um, so again, I wouldn't, you know, don't be thrown off and don't think that just because they might appear to have a pulpy style of art on the cover or just be something completely different from what we're used to seeing in the traditional comic format, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad content or somehow a lower form of reading. It's not. So typically when you have something with this very highly stylized art, it is introducing a more complex layered form of uh, meanings that really challenges the concepts of uh, comprehension. So I'm to check to see if there are any questions as we're going along with this. All right. Fantastic. <clears throat> So moving on, here's just a brief list of some major publishers. Most people are really familiar with Marvel Comics. You have your Avengers, your X-Men versus DC, where Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, all of that. And then you get into some of your um, uh, more kind of one-off fantasy science fiction publishers like Dark Horse Comics and Images, um, IDW Publishing, they um, have done a lot of reboots of things like Star Trek, Doctor Who over the years. Um, Fantagraphics, Kodansha, and Viz, those are some of the more well-known uh, manga imprints. But a lot of right now, um, with a lot of the graphic novel nonfiction that's being produced, those are even more um, widely, more independent. They publish titles. But we are starting to see a lot of our traditional um, book publishers get in on the fun, such as Scholastic, um, Random House. A lot of them are doing a lot of great things, especially around youth literature with their titles. So the biggest thing to really understand, <laughs> and it's probably something that I have said multiple, multiple times um, to people, is that to are kind of off put or don't really understand graphic novels is they're stopped immediately by the word graphic. <clears throat> they assume that it has some kind of risque or <laughs> adult leaning um, meaning behind it, and that's just simply not true. Um, graphic novels are simply defined book, book length comics. So we're going back to that very first slide with all the definitions. Again, sometimes they tell a single continuous narrative from the first page to the last. Sometimes they're collections of shorter stories or individual comic strips. Comics are sequential visual art, usually with text, that are often told in a series of rectangular panels. So despite the name, not all comics are funny. Many comics and graphic novels emphasize drama, adventure, character development, striking visuals, politics, or romance 
over our laugh out loud comedy. <clears throat> so again, graphic novels usually have a higher production value than a typical staple comic. Um, and although a graphic novel usually stands on its own as a complete story, it is possible to have an ongoing series or a limited series of graphic novels telling a single story or a series of related stories. There are mature and adult themes and adult and content, um, I'm sorry, content titles for audiences, but it does not exclusively mean explicit content. Graphic novels and comics exist for readers of all ages, from preschool and up through adults. So just a brief history here, and the following content um, pictures and information is from a really great resource that is still um, archived over at the Internet Public Library website. So that's a great place to go for some more um, background and context on this topic. Um, most historians agree that the first real graphic novel was Will Eisner's A Contract with God and Other Tenement Stories, published in 1978. Um, it mm. is more adult in its images, themes, and languages, and the book spoke to the generation that had first grown up with superhero comics in the 1940s and the 1950s, what was kind of considered to be the golden age of comics. But then underground comics artists like Harvey Picar and R. Crumb inspired the early graphic novelists. Um, and just kind of a little side note, sometimes you'll see comics spelled C-O-M-I-X, and that's an alternate spelling of comics that deliberately differentiated these artists from the respectable comic codes obeying mainstream comic books that um, was kind of seen you know, with your traditional superheroes like Batman and Superman, but then in the 50s and 60s with a lot of the political uh, things that were going on at the time, the threat of McCarthyism, they were really toned and tamed down to uh, kind of be very pro-government and send um, lots of moral lessons. So anything that fell outside of that or would be considered diverse, uh, representing diverse and different voices went more underground <clears throat> until probably the 80s. Um, many later graphic novel writers and artists got their start at places like Marvel and DC Comics drawing and writing superheroes like the Fantastic Four and the X-Men. Uh, comic writers uh, consider people like Art Spiegelman's Mouse, which was published in 1986 and is a nonfiction um, memoir hybrid. Alan Moore's The Watchmen, and also published in 1986, along with Frank Miller's Batman, the Dark Knight Returns, uh, which the latest um, uh, Christian Bale film series was inspired by, hmm. also in 1986. So we're kind of seeing a trend here with our publishing years. Um, and then Neil Gaiman's Sandman series that began in 1990. And then Gilbert and Jamie Hernandez's Love and Rockets in 1994 to be among the 100 great graphic no novels public libraries should consider having in their collection. So now we're going to focus a little bit more, now we kind of have a foundation understanding of looking at the educational benefits of graphic novels. The average comic book introduces children to nearly twice as many new words as the average children's book, and more than five times as many as the average child-adult conversation. Many schools are using comic books as a way to encourage reluctant readers. Comic books contribute to the development of visual literacy, as we've already discussed. And even before children are ready to read text, comic books can give them practice in understanding material printed on the page, tracking left to right and top to bottom, and inferring what happens between individual panels in a story. Again, comic books often contain more advanced vocabulary than traditional books at the same age or grade level. So something <laughs> you'll hear a lot or um, from people that want to challenge the format, and this was even um, as recently um, publicized again as in a story that came out a week ago in the New Yorker magazine uh, that was titled The Goosebumps Conundrum, What Makes a Children's Book Good? 
again, there's this uh, idea that there's supposed to be some, um, you know, morally superior tone uh, to literature. And this even goes all the way back to the very foundations of children's literature, children's services, and libraries. Um, so you'll get questions like, does having read the novelization of the latest superhero movie count as having read a book? Or if they're just reading a graphic novel based on a line of toys, a la My Little Pony, um, does that count as reading? And the answer is absolutely yes. You want to encourage reading regardless of what the subject matter is. And graphic novels and comic books are an absolute fantastic gateway uh, because they're often playing up on pop culture, something that people are already familiar with. So I always jokingly say it's a gateway drug <laughs> <laughs> to other more um, perhaps finer literature that we're wanting to <laughs> later push. <clears throat> so here's my little buddy here. I love his, you oh. know, Captain America costume. It's from the National Archives. Um, graphic novels offer appealing stories and engaging visuals that reach out to reluctant readers, visual learners, and others who may shy away from traditional print-heavy books. Yet graphic novels offer the same benefits of regular books, introducing young people to new vocabulary, book language, and stories and information to teach them about their world and spark their imagination. In fact, um, one author, Stephen Weiner, reports that researchers concluded that the average uh, graphic novel, as we've already discussed, introduced twice as many words. And then Francesca uh, Goldsmith, who has a, is an author on a reader's advisory book that we'll mention in a few moments, points out that the kind of abstraction that competent and comfortable text reading requires is also demanded by the graphic novel. <clears throat> Fiction and nonfiction graphic novels can bring another perspective to classes in language arts or social studies. For instance, elementary school classrooms discussing current events could also read something like Aaliyah's Mission, which was published by the uh, imprint Knopf in 2004. This graphic novel tells a true story of the Iraqi librarian Aaliyah Muhammad Baker, who in 2003 saved thousands of library books from being destroyed during the war. Graphic novel versions of the accomplishments of Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks, or Paul Revere um, can bring valuable lessons to life. Indeed, there are even lesson plans for using graphic novels in classroom, as well as print and internet resources to assist school media specialists in developing educational graphic novel collections. <clears throat> so a lot of researchers also point, you know, Back to quotes like that that say fun has no place in the whole idea of reading. We just know that that is nonsense. The goal uh, appears to be getting kids reading the canons and the classics as soon as possible, whether they really understand the work um, that's in it or not. So bottom line, the number one thing to remember is nothing is more damaging to the love of reading than the belief that it is something you do primarily for someone else. Yet, there are basic concepts and information that students need to know. Yes, teachers are held liable for how well or not the students learn this basic information. However, it does not necessarily follow from these facts that comics are bad because kids like them or that all comics are trash. Before teachers make judgments about comics, they should read them and consider this. As every universal theme found in literature has been done well in comic form. This is becoming true as well for nonfiction comics focused on content areas like history and science. Comics present complex stories and information in a format that often has onboard scaffolding for readers. Text bubbles, for example, are less intimidating to struggling and reluctant readers. The pictures, narration, and placement of text in comics allows readers multiple opportunities for successfully navigating text. And that was um, all research and from the John Hopkins School of Education in an article that was titled, In a Single Bound, A Short Primer on Comics for Education. <clears throat> There's also a lot of um, advocacy on the national level and through programs from both the American Library Association and the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. Um, the current ambassador, this is a photo of him, is the graphic novel 
um, author, author and artist Jean Lewin Yang. Um, the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature Program was established in 2008 by the Children's Book Council, known as the CBC, Every Child a Reader, and the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress. The program is administered by Every Child a Reader, and over the last eight years, uh, the program has reached millions of young readers and their caregivers in the United States. Jean Lewin Yang is the Prince Award-winning author, which is an uh, annual award given by the Young Adult Library Services Association of the ALA. Um, and he won for his book, American Born Chinese, and has been a two-time National Book Award finalist. Yang is the country's fifth National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. And he was recently the artist behind the, uh, this year's National Library Week campaign art. And he was also um, interviewed just um, about a week ago when the National uh, Book Fair was going on. And uh, his article, I highly suggest you going into that and reading it a little bit further. It was published by the Washington Post titled MacArthur Genius Grantee on Teaching Kids with Comics. So every year there's um, a large, very, very competitive uh, grant to kind of um, provide educational support across all the different disciplines. And Yang was only one of two people who were awarded grants um, labeled as a visual storyteller. And so his main takeaway as to why these are important to start integrating them into um, education and just getting them into the hands of as many kids as possible is that um, this art form particularly is great for tying together the idea of art and technology as interrelated and interconnected. I don't know to anybody else, but to me that screams STEAM. Obviously, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Um, for example, his new book that will be out within the coming months is called Secret Coders, and it is his first, in his own words, intentionally educational book that he hopes through the format, by the end of reading it, children will be able to understand the foundations of history of computer coding. Um, also, graphics have won Newbery Honors and Caldecott Honors. They've made several National Book Awards shortlists. Uh, for example, as it'll just be up on your screen, the third volume of the March series by uh, Representative John Lewis that chronicles the civil uh, rights struggle in the 60s is on the shortlist for this year's National Book Award finalists. And he also says, for those of you that are, you know, very steeped in children's literature, heck, even Kate D. Camillo has written comics. Thus, the beloved author of um, the award-winning title, Because of When Dixie, but um, her latest Newbery-winning title, Flora and Ulysses, is half graphic, graphic novel. And in his words, how are you going to deny Kate D. Camillo? Which I completely agree. <laughs> <clears throat> His newest campaign is called Reading uh, Without Walls, and it was inspired by his platform for the National Ambassadors Program. Um, if you want more information about this uh, campaign, you can visit the CBC uh, website, or you can also search the hashtag on Twitter and Instagram called hashtag reading without walls. And it is very essential um, through uh, formats like graphic novels, um, you're hoping to just expand your world view and really become connected to people that are very different from yourself. So there's a really great opportunity for libraries to um, get in on this really great new program. Right now they're actually trying to collect anecdotes and stories uh, through the Reading Without Walls website about um, children's and educators' experiences um, with diverse um, stories. Um, Yang is also a very big advocate and author you'll see uh, writing a lot under the We Need Diverse Books hashtag as well. So the current challenge has three rules. Uh, number one, you need to read to meet someone new who he says doesn't look or live like you. Uh, number two, read to learn about a topic you don't know much about, like science or something else in STEM. And number three, read in a format you are not used to, such as a graphic novel. So again, uh, if you go to the website, you can actually print off uh, free posters like this to hang in your library, promote your collections, 
and this would be a really great collaborative opportunity to reach out uh, to local teachers in your community. Just remember to use the hashtag to uh, promote everything and visit the website for more information. So now I've given you a ton <laughs> of information about you know all these educational talking points and so another really great um, resource to uh, kind of condense it into a really beautiful little packet is on the Random House uh, Publishers website. If you go to um, randomhouse.com backslash teachers, and there's a little link that um, should hopefully be active where you can um, click out to the website. They have this educator's guide that goes through um, the points that we've discussed, but also more finer points uh, stylistically that have to do with elements of art. That would be really neat um, to use in beginner's uh, perhaps workshop where you might have kids create their own graphic novels. Or if you're just wanting to do something as simple as a graphic novel book club, um, these online guides have some really great universal discussion prompts and questions. And again, it is all free. Just go to the website, uh, download your own copy, and you can probably even contact the publisher for a number of um, free copies to use as handouts. You weren't going to get away without us pushing our own <laughs> material as well. So if you visit KDLA's uh, catalog, we do have several professional titles uh, that you can check out. We're always, we would love to take recommendations for more if you have any. Um, so uh, a brand new one that we um, just uh, got in a couple weeks ago is called Wonderfully Wordless, the 500 Most Recommended Graphic Novels and Picture Books. Uh, according to the publishers, this is the first comprehensive best book guide to wordless picture books, and it is an indispensable resource for parents and teachers who love graphic storytelling or who recognize the value of these exceptional books and working with different types of students, particularly preschool, English as a second language, special needs, and creative writers. And I really do want to uh, hit on that, uh, the point about ESL students, English as a second language. Um, picture books, graphic novels are again a perfect entryway because you're removing that barrier of a, you know, a prescribed language. You know, pictures, images, um, you know, and all that sensory um, feelings that goes on around that. Those are all universal things, and it's really, really great to, um, way to connect with different folks in your community that might not speak the same language as you do. So if you keep an eye out to the listserv, you might see this coming back around, again, in that Reader's Advisory uh, webinar that we'll do next year. <clears throat> All right, so now we're going to kind of shift away into the next section of today's presentation. Um, how do you know what to buy? How do you know where to turn if you um, don't consider yourself to be, you know, an expert on this topic? So I do wholeheartedly believe you do not have to be an avid reader of the genre to have them in your library and to do it well. Uh, what I like to say is fake it until you make it. So, <laughs> so some things that we had done um, as previously um, at a library where um, the collection was started uh, basically by someone who, you know, was a pretty uh, big fan of the genre. They, they like to read in it, but they were also a youth person, so there was an automatic assumption, oh, okay, you work with kids, you know what's great, so you're going to buy them, which that's very flattering and all, but that's not always <laughs> the reality of the situation. Um, so what we did is we instead made a team of selectors um, between um, somebody to cover adult graphic novels, children's, and then team. And so those three selectors, who were also doing programming with the public, that I think is a key to point out, those three individuals worked with the collection development librarian um, to create kind of an ad hoc um, way to buy them, because this was kind of early on before um, more of your traditional um, library vendors, such as Baker and Taylor and Ingram, had a lot of resources devoted to the genre. And so again, um, but we're also, you know, we're looking, this was an attempt to look at the collection um, as a system, very holistically. Um, one of the biggest things right off the bat that we did was um, that the graphic novels had 
their own shelving, had their own code that was separate from Dewey. Um, I do know this can be kind of controversial. Um, some people uh, still, uh, you know, want to put them in the, oh, I'm starting to lose track of my numbers now, like the 640s or, you know, where you would also find nonfiction books about uh, maybe the history of comic books or arts or different things like that. Or then, you know, you would also have some of that would be spread out and later you would see them in the 800s or the 900s if it was a title that was about history and um, a, maybe a memoir. I go against that because I think why make it harder on your patrons to find them? You know, if they like, uh, you know, reading, I don't know, a title about Batman, then maybe they might also like to learn, read the same memoir about I don't know, a real life adventure or something like that, why not kind of have them all living as closely together as possible? So our standard scheme was to create a called number that GN to stand for graphic novel plus the author's last name. We did things a little bit differently um, when it came to, you know, interfiling, at least in the fiction, um, your popular superhero series. So in that case, it was just, we gave, instead of collecting every individual, like if Batman was written by a Frank Miller or was written by Grant Morrison, you wouldn't go under GN um, Morrison or, you know, um, something like that. We just put them all collectively together under the header, the superseder of the character's name. So um, I will admit I'm not a cataloger <laughs> by nature or anything like that, but we did have, um, but it did open up avenues to have those really uh, nice conversations with the people that did that for us and just kind of, kind of come to some kind of understanding or agreement of what works best for our patrons. So setting aside, you know, sometimes we have to be flexible about the rules of library science and all of that fun stuff and kind of look at what is best uh, for the patron. Mm. And I do hear a little bit of typing and clinking there. See if there's any questions yes, that are coming up. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. <clears throat> However, this is not to be confused in saying that you should shelf every single thing together. Um, <clears throat> most, you know, a lot of people are, you know, concerned, especially in smaller libraries where uh, space is at a premium. Um, but no, you need to shelf them all by the audience, and we'll get into ratings um, shortly after this. Um, you know, the teen title should be self shelved separately from the children's titles on, like, you know, SpongeBob and Mickey Mouse and all of that stuff. And then The Walking Dead, which is a male, or, or I'm sorry, is a, <laughs> an adult title, mature title, that is clearly going to be somewhere else. And then, um, you know, graphic nonfiction, is its own thing, so shelve that accordingly. So, for example, um, and I will be more than happy um, if anybody wants to contact me afterwards, I can send you some photos um, in my former library, what this kind of looked like there. Um, you know, we had a standalone shelving, and it would be all of the fiction in one section followed right after that by the nonfiction. So, you know, just using a little bit of common sense. So um, while it may not necessarily be common, it is, it does make sense. <laughs> so just kind of think thoughtfully on all of that. And I think, if, you know, just some proactive thought and reflection on the backside will save you on the other from having to worry about issues of uh, censorship and whatnot. And also just ultimately remember that regardless of where your titles do end up being located in your library, it is not our place uh, to uh, prevent them from going home and, you know, being seen and being read. So, you know, again, if a teen just so happens to want to also check out The Walking Dead, follow uh, your library's policy, but also within the scope that we are not in the place of the parent which is different. It makes us separate and different and unique from those in the uh, school system. <clears throat> so 
So again, this is just a, a little bit, a little bit of a taste of um, something that you might uh, see more of uh, later on in a full-fledged uh, reader's advisory version of this presentation. But this is just an overview of all of the different types of uh, titles, the diversity of titles that you will see nowadays um, in graphic novels. These were um, some titles that I bought for our uh, teen collection, everything from you can get really great versions of the Bible uh, printed in graphic novel format to classics canonical titles like The Hobbit to all of the different Shakespeare plays to uh, memoirs to topics as you know one would consider pretty dry like economics uh, but I find uh, that you know when they're done in this um, format they tend to again be more accessible just whimsical um, in nature but but also really getting in some hard-hitting um, information. I really especially love the series that's called The Graphic Canon. Um, they'll go through different eras in history, in literature, and they often bring together various uh, different types of graphic novel artists uh, working today to reinterpret the classics. So I think those are um, a great sell, especially to uh, teachers that you may be working with. So um, ratings, <clears throat> I will say this now and I'll probably say it again before the end of the webinar. Um, it, it, there is no real standardization across the publishers. And so your best uh, reviewer is yourself. Um, I, I know it can't be done all the time, but if there's ever any question about the content, I highly recommend you finding some sort of system um, within your library to have it um, to be read so you can have kind of like a consensus, a group ahead of time um, about where you might want to label things. People are getting better and better about putting their own their own um, ratings on there. Um, but some you might, where you want to be careful is where you're looking at the manga ratings versus the Western, traditionally Western comic publishers. So um, a lot of the content that you might see in manga and other um, Eastern genres are there tend to be, they can have a little bit of a cultural difference. So this is just kind of an example of some of their uh, ratings, what they might look like. Um, and again, they're just not necessarily comparable to what we might be used to. Um, but so things like A is pretty standard. That's all ages. You're not going to really find anything um, that could be controversial or anything like that. Um, a rating that is a youth, uh, you might want to think of that similar to a PG movie rating. And it rate means that the title might contain uh, very mild violence or the occasional curse word. Um, something that's labeled T for teen, that's typically around a PG-13 um, film rating. And that may suggest that the content could include some sexual innuendo or more violent action scenes. Now, older teen, typically think of a 16, uh, 17, might contain um, more sexual situations and might also include things like blood or gore. And then mature kind of speaks for itself. And so, again, this is a really great uh, breakdown of that information by one of the most popular um, manga publishers, Yen Press. <clears throat> but, um, you know, again, the publishers, a lot of the other publishers are getting on the ball with being a lot uh, more descriptive in their reviews. Uh, School Library Journal and the New York Times both have a separate and dedicated graphic novel review sites. ALA has um, best of lists that they do now. Um, a more kind of advanced resource is... Um, there's this website here uh, called No Flying, No Tights. It was created by librarians, so it's by librarians, for librarians. And again, they have a very explicit clause that um, is on their website, uh, a directive to publishers. They only review things that libraries could collect. So that is a fantastic um, resource. I highly recommend checking that out. But when all else fails, 
I say select like the pros. Um, again, you do not have to be an expert. Make friends with the people at your local comic shop. Um, you know, go this um, magazine here. It's called Previews. Its audience is um, the people behind are the people behind comic book shops. So it has a lot of more in there. It has a lot more merchandise in there and things like that. But it has predominantly one of the best features is always like the top, I think, 20 a list of what's uh, popular, what's selling the best in comic book shops around the world. You know if it's selling really good here, it's going to circulate well at your library. Um, so uh, I previously had really great working relationships with the, um, my comic book shops where they would give me this book that usually retails for about $10 a copy. I don't know, it may have gone up since then. This was a few years ago. They would give us this book for free. And that was just fantastic. And they would often come in and have those like, hey, we want you to check this out. Hey, have you thought about buying this um, for your library? Just absolutely fantastic uh, website. They do. Um, they are on Facebook and Twitter. They have a free newsletter that I highly recommend signing up for. Even if you don't go and get this book, just get the free um, newsletter because it will come with those bestsellers lists. Um, let's see. They often on their website. They would every Monday morning um, do a new weekly releases update, and then every Wednesday an upcoming online releases. So I cannot speak enough to what a valuable resource this is. I think it's even far and above better than things that you're going to see through um, out outlets like Baker and Taylor, where you would traditionally get your library materials from because, again, this is a niche in the community. <clears throat> so here are some suggested uh, blogs to follow. And this is why I would really like to have a lot more interaction within the chat if anybody has uh, some websites that they like to read um, for fun. And again, I really rely on pop culture. You know, what is going on? So io9, um, it's just a popular uh, science fiction kind of fantasy website. And they do a little bit of everything from just like quirky things in the news to legitimate science stories and updates, and then how that is reflected um, across culture in books, film, and music. And so they're always right on there kind of breaking news all the time about all of your superhero things that you'll see uh, coming out to movies. Um, I really love the websites, um, <laughs> DC Women Kicking Ass and the Mary Sue. The Mary Sue is just a kind of a funny wink and nod uh, to a traditional uh, character stereotype mm -hmm. that you would see. But they really they do a great job of reviewing uh, materials through a feminist lens and also being more inclusive. Um, of uh, youth literature as well. <clears throat> and again, all of these uh, tie all of these names here on this list, you could put into Google and find uh, very easily. Most of the um, the sites listed on this slide, though, are going to predominantly cover things that would probably be um, material that's probably more um, adult in scope and theme and audience. Maybe some crossover um, teen interest. The following website, or the following slide here, these are specifically things that are going to feature a lot more youth content. Again, we have No Flying, No Tights website. Good Comics for Kids is the column um, that is featured in School Library Journal. And then um, About.com, which you <laughs> wouldn't think of, you probably haven't heard about that in a long time, but they have an incredibly fantastic website. Uh, website for manga would often feature um, a lot more extensive lists and diverse titles than um, you would see. And they just kept up with it a lot more and would uh, link out several different unique um, resources. And it was kind of a great starting place to become familiar with all of the different uh, publishers. That have changed a lot over the years, especially um, with some things that have happened between Eastern and Western markets. It's just a really, really great starting spot. So we'll move on ahead to my favorite part, is using uh, these titles as a springboard for programming. And again, it's not just 
something only for adults or it's not just for maybe millennials. It's, you know, for kids to really everybody all ages. So obviously probably the biggest and easiest thing to do, um, you know, when we think of comic books, you think of teens and think of um, cosplays. Um, it's reminding me because I just saw their great presentation they did at the Kentucky Library Association conference last month. Um, but if you missed that, uh, do please check out KDLA's archived webinars page um, under the library link up header. You can check out fandom events and see about how four or five different libraries have approached this type of programming and all of the different things that they did. Uh, this is just a picture from one that I did when I was at um, Boone County of the of a doctor and his TARDIS. <laughs> I thought that was really cute. We just got a brand new um, book into KDLA's collection that you can check out um, called Cosplay and Libraries, How to Embrace Costume Play. And just some other things, you know, fun things to um, programs, maybe like a, an ongoing fandom to where you could explore a different uh, show or popular title every month and do, you know, activities, crafts, trivia around that. <clears throat> Preschool, yes, they too can get in on the fun. So <laughs> Disney is starting to publish a lot more of their popular characters into uh, comic book formats, even for girls as well. So a popular program uh, that we did, and yes, embarrassingly enough, that is me on the right dress as Snow White. <laughs> Hard act to follow with uh, Cinderella there on the left. She was um, absolutely fantastic, and there are much poor beleaguered Prince Charming there in the middle. Um, so maybe do something like a princess picnic. And even though we say princess, I, um, I feel very passionately about uh, doing inclusive programming that is not uh, gendered. We had little boys come to this program as well. We had a, um, a little boy had his princess dress on, and we even had one dressed as a dragon. It was cool fantastic. So again, it does not have to be exclusively uh, two girls. Anybody can get on the fun. I challenge you guys to think of all different types of um, activities. So we had, we would do a read aloud, have them make a crown or a tiara. We'd have tea time snacks, and then they actually got to um, write a letter that was. There is a website you can go get um, an address that will actually be sent off to a character at Disney World, and they will get their own. Um, return, you just, the parents do a self-addressed envelope in the program, and they will get a letter several weeks um, later in the mail address from a Disney character. So that's a lot of fun. Um, another spin on that is just the same thing, but you can call it a superhero story in time. And maybe switch it up, do an obstacle course, uh, you know, have your cardboard cutouts that you can take pictures with. Just, you know, the possibilities are really limitless, and I highly recommend getting on Pinterest. <laughs> Some other family all ages programming is International Game Day. This is something sponsored by the American Library Association in partnership uh, with some tabletop uh, gaming communities. Um, I'll say this graphic, I know the graphic is a little old. I was just up on their website and I don't, for some reason, I'm not sure if there's just some changes that are going on. They don't quite have the artwork and different things up for 2016 yet. Uh, but it's just every November. It's kind of a, one of those national um, observed holiday things now. So pick out a weekend. Um, once a month, I have her libraries are successfully doing this as a monthly uh, series now. But hey, that's another great way to partner with your comic book shop is invite them in. They often get free things that they'll want to demo. They may even kick in um, some free prizes. So, you know, a lot of, um, uh, of the graphic novels have come out of the board gaming community and, you know, vice versa. Now, they're, you know, some are going back to these popular characters and doing those popular deck building games um, off of things like all the DC and the Marvel characters and whatnot. So this is just kind of a fun um, entryway. And again, you don't have to be the experts. You do not have to know how to play these games yourself. Just have them in your library, put it out there. You might be um, pleasantly surprised that you'll get coming through your door and people's already familiarity with them. <clears throat> The big, like the, if you do nothing else <laughs> in the entire year around this, um, do get in on free comic book day. It is the first Saturday in May. There is the website. Uh, sometimes, if you're lucky, it will coincide with the, with the uh, Star Wars May the 4th Be With You um, holiday. 
Um, a lot of publishers uh, will give out free titles to give away. So um, again, I had really wonderful comic book shop that they would set. Uh, I think they gave us 250 free copies to give away of a title, and then charge us at a very, very low rate, like something like 20 cents or something ridiculous for um, mm -hmm. copies to give out after that. So we would just divide them up. Um, among the branches and uh, typically the previews the publishers will have out at teasers um, for what those titles will be um, in February or March so kind of keep an eye out uh, if you get that previews magazine they will have a teaser for free comic book day around that time of the year and so just get on it as soon as you can um, some popular things that we've seen over the years have seen um, the Adventure Time series, it started off as a free comic book day promotion. Um, and I've also, I believe, like the Disney um, Tinkerbell, like the fairy series um, mm -hmm. for kind of early readers started off um, there too. I know the past couple years, The Walking Dead has done some big um, promotional tie ins to that. So just they have lots and lots of different things going on. So if you do nothing else, do that promotion. <clears throat> Let's see. And that's something that just kind of think about, um, you know, if you're looking for sources of professional development on the topic or just how to get outside of your library and get more embedded in your community, um, think about having a table at a bigger um, Comic Con. They, there are starting to be more and more. Um, popping up around the state. This is just a graphic from one that we've had in northern Kentucky. Um, we just happen to be very lucky. We have this one held on the Kentucky side of the river and then there is this full-on Cincinnati Comic Con uh, that's held there so I think a couple weeks after. But there are big uh, toy and comic book and gaming conventions too that are held in Lexington, in Louisville, and there's just starting to be more and more um, coming on board. So I think it's a really great networking opportunity. You can go um, see what's pop. If nothing else, just browse and see what's popular. So you might get ideas of some things that are kind of cutting edge that you might want to collect for your library. Again, you might come across some free swag that you can collect and give away um, at programs. And um, if nothing else, you might want to just, again, go set up a table and do some really fun out-of-the-box library advocacy. If, if you have a way to virtually uh, connect people so they can get library cards um, while they're there. I think that's a wonderful promotion. You know, have a photo booth where you say, like, you know, get caught with your library card and have people, one, they're dressed up because a lot of times these people will come in full-on costume and cosplay to these conventions. That would be a really fun viral marketing campaign just to have that set up um, at your neighboring thing. And, hey, you know, if you can't, if you may, maybe in a region where you're afraid of competing, why don't you get together with the libraries in your surrounding counties and go in on it together? So just something to kind of think about. <clears throat> so we've kind of covered, like I said, a very <laughs> broad array of topics within um, today's webinar. There's just a lot of different things to hit on uh, and to think about. Um, but, you know, some final kind of things to take away. Again, you are your best reviewer. It's great to start um, with these websites that have lists and these magazines that have titles. Um, but when there's always any sort of question because it's just, it's just not a perfect science, you know, um, just stop and read the books yourselves or get the team together if you have any um, kind of concern about where something um, should be shelved who the intended audience is. And um, just promote. I think this uh, collection more than anything else really lends itself well to um, high visibility and really taps into kind of like the heartstrings of what people are know, find fun, and what they um, can connect with. And again, it's just a way to get um, diverse readers across all groups really together on to one topic. Um, and really find somebody, you know, in your community, whether it's a local gaming store, um, a local, you know, or even just, you know, a local um, bookshop if you don't have anything but like a, 
a Barnes and Noble or something to that effect. I'm sure there's somebody there that is also uh, kind of in this same boat. So just find your own team, find your own network um, to get together with to make the job just a little bit easier. <clears throat> So with that, I'll kind of open up the floor to some questions. I do realize I'm a fast talker. <laughs> so I tend to get through material in a little bit shorter amount of time. So is there anything that anyone would like to go back and revisit or have some questions on? Yeah, I know some people probably want to see titles, and that training is coming. <laughs> we will do an updated version um, of that training early in 2017. And while people are typing in their questions and concerns, I'll just kind of bring up the next um, screens. It's just some reminders. A great way um, to share this all year round to share your questions and concerns or to join uh, KDLA's listservs. Um, I'm a big fan and proponent of the Kayak Listserv, which is a discussion list devoted to those who work with children and teens in libraries, even though graphic novels I know are not an exclusively <laughs> children topic. but. Um, you can subscribe there, um, and then you can find out some more lists, such as um, technology, adult services, uh, bookmobile outreach, and more by visiting uh, the listservs page off of KDLA's website. You can also follow us on social media. We do have a dedicated presence on there, and we promote everything from our webinars to just really neat articles that we see come across the library literature as well as learning opportunities um, elsewhere. So we are on Twitter. We would love more followers there. So find us at, at KDLA Lib Dev because who wants to have a handle that says library development? <laughs> I don't know if that's Twitter approved, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Got to keep it short. Mm -hmm. And then we're also on Facebook at KDLA CE, so continuing education team. So that's uh, typically, the folks that are contributing to both those are myself, um, our awesome CE team, Alicia McGrath, Charlie Taylor, Valerie Edgeworth, and their technology consultant, Lauren Abner. Um, but if you have recommendations for things that um, you would like to see us promote more, I know we did a survey, but please just reach out to any of us at any time. Or if you have suggestions for um, other uh, targeted social media or promotions that you'd like to see, Please don't hesitate to let us know. <clears throat> a few other uh, trainings that will be coming up very soon that you might want to save the date for. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, on Thursday, November 3rd, will be the next uh, School Libraries Link Up webinar. This will be an introduction to a service called HANDS that does in home. Um, support for uh, soon-to-be uh, parents that will be coming up on Thursday, November 3rd at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 2 p.m. Central. And then I believe Alicia will be leading uh, the in December the Library Link Up Best of 2016 programming. So that will be Thursday, December the 1st at 1 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Central. So again, you can find that and much more by visiting KDLA's Continuing Education Events Calendar. And I'll check back in to see if there are any further questions, any further thoughts. If nothing comes to you at this time, now you're, you know how to find me, uh, give me a call. I do like hearing from folks <laughs> when I'm at the office. Or just shoot me a quick email at krista.king-oaks at ky.gov. I'd love to hear your thoughts and your feedback. Thank you all for spending a little bit of your Tuesday afternoon with me.